Hello, this is Tim Harris with the Harris Real Estate University, and this is the Harris Real Estate University Superstar Interview with someone who, frankly, in our real estate industry has been somewhat controversial and in many ways a leader for many of us to follow. And that is Mr. John Maddox, and he's the CEO and founder of YouWalkAway.com. So, John, welcome to the call. Thanks for having me on. John, I'm excited about this interview. Frankly, this is something I've wanted to talk with you probably for the past two and three years. I read pretty much everything you guys publish on your website. I've been republishing with permission some of your content onto our website, Real Estate Insider News. You have a unique perspective on the industry, but I have to I'm going to take you back to like 2007, 2008. Uh, that was about when you guys got started, right? Correct. Yeah, we started right at the end of 2007 after the mortgage crash. So why, what motivated you to get started? How, why, I, out of the blue, this controversial idea of showing people how to basically do, you know, the, the, how they can uh, have an alternative to being and stuck in an underwater house or having to face down a, a mortgage. What motivated you to do that? Because there certainly wasn't anybody else in the country offering that service at the time. Right. Well, I was in the mortgage business for 11 years when I came up with the idea. And the, and the idea really came from, a lack of, uh, for lack of better terms, I really needed a job. My mortgage industry had crumbled, and I had a you know multi-branch uh, company in California, and uh, lots of loan officers, and it just started you know dwindling before my eyes, and you know revenues were halting faster than you could imagine, and uh, I really was sitting there in my one of my offices, and you know thinking, what the heck am I going to do with you know the next what's the next play, what, you know, what's going to happen. And I realized that, you know, these people that couldn't refinance or they couldn't uh, buy, um, but mo more importantly, the ones that couldn't refinance that were in loans that they didn't put any money down, um, you know, that they were going to be kind of stuck in a situation where they couldn't really sell or they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, you know, if they needed to relocate for a job, they couldn't do it because they were stuck in a house. And, so I started researching a little bit about the laws on foreclosure, and, and interestingly enough, when I was, uh, you know, in this business for 11 years and, and doing loans and mortgages and, and things, uh, really there was no ever need for me to know any laws about foreclosure because it simply wasn't there. I mean, if someone went into foreclosures because truly they uh, either were in divorce or they. Um, you know, were really bad off in a situation, and uh, and and a lot of times they would have equity, so it'd be an easy enough play. They could sell it or, um, you know, figure it out. But this is a unique scenario that you know in, that I'd I'd never seen, and no one that I know knew at the time knew anything about it. But I figured if I didn't know anything about it, being in this business for 11 years, being the president of a mortgage small mortgage company, you know, how much less would the average person who bought a house during the boom and, you know, didn't have any equity, how much less would they know um, and be in a situation where they were really afraid of what was going to happen. So um, quickly I, you know, did some Google searches and I, you're right, I didn't see anything online other than, you know, Kelly Clarkson's walk away, you know, music <laughs> video on YouTube. That was, that was practically the only thing on there. Um, and then I typed in foreclosure into Google and it was really just nothing but ads saying, you know, stop foreclosure, save your home. And I just uh, sort of sat back and thought, wow, you know, no one is, truly no one is saying, you know, this is an option. Uh, and so quickly I thought, well, is, you know, is it illegal to, to tell someone that they could do this? So I, I talked to an attorney friend of mine who was a buddy and kind of presented him the idea. And he thought it was a great idea and started doing some research on his part and we can we kind of came up with an affordable you know turnkey plan to really educate people and help them kind of explore all their options and then you know plan for the worst and hope for the best well so you know it's interesting the mindset it's 2007 actually ironically John is when we started offering short sale training on a nationwide basis it was May of 2007 actually which is probably about the same time you started showing people how to you know strategically default and walk away from their mortgages but i remember when we started teaching short sales we got so much flack from the real estate industry, uh, you know, and not even they weren't even trying to hide the idea of, oh my gosh, you're trying to show p agents, teach agents how to show people how to, you know, short sale their home. People should pay their mortgages. They should stay in their mortgage. You remember that? The, the, yeah. the conversation back in 2008, 2009, it was sometimes uncomfortable because people were so much against the idea of, you know, I think Professor White explains it from Arizona. He explains it the best, you know. 
there's two sides of the mortgage contract. What happens when you pay? You get to stay. And what happens if you don't? These are the things that happen. And for some reason, people couldn't you know, wrap their minds around the fact that strategically defaulting and getting rid of this underwater mortgage it wasn't only you know it wasn't only legal certainly but it was also frankly financially by far and i would say 9 times out of 10 the best thing for people to do for themselves and their families so you had to go through the thick of it 100 times worse than me because you were going right to homeowners correct and uh you know each time that the uh the media would put an article out we would get Lots of, you know, as you can imagine, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of emails, and, and certainly a good share of hate mail uh, from people that are saying, you know, these these people are deadbeats. Why are you encouraging them to freeload and, you know, to not, you know, what's wrong with America now and you know, all these crazy <laughs> things. And even uh, we were on Neil Cavuto. Neil Cavuto um, made this outrageous example that, uh, you know, World War II. What if we weren't, you know, what if we just said. You know, to heck with it. And we never, um, you know, we never uh, went after the Japanese or the or the the Nazis because you know we just didn't want to stand by our word or something. It was it was ridiculous. But you know, they would attack us and and things like that. But you know, thankfully, uh, we were always on the side of the homeowners and not not the side of at that point, which was you know looked at very negatively, was the banks and how they were taking a lot of bailout money and then. You know, turning around and going um, to you know resorts and and all that stuff. So, yeah. well, I have to ask since you mentioned Neil Cavuto, uh, you were on 60 Minutes, correct? Yeah, YouWalkAway.com was my partner was interviewed by Morley Saper. Oh. So, so you know, you and I are about the same age, and we grew up when 60 Minutes was you know that would be terrifying as a business owner to have you know 60 Minutes knock on your door because you think for sure you did something wrong, and oh my gosh, it's going to be some sort of attack interview. Or whatever. <laughs> What, did you guys get the call for 60 Minutes directly, or did it come through a PR agent? How did that actually work? It actually did come directly, and I was very excited because at this point, uh, I was in 2010, and it was early in 2010 when we got the call. Um, and at that point, we've been, we had been on you know Brian Williams' Nightly News. We've been on ABC Nightline, Good Morning America, Today's Show, and they were all very you know semi-positive. There really wasn't. Uh, much negativity on it, and you know we'd been squeaky clean with the Better Business Bureau, with you know all of the clients that we had. We really had just very few um, complaints, if if any, and so we we were confident at this point that you know what we were doing was you know was really just helping people at an affordable cost, and and helping them sleep at night, and help help them kind of get their you know their bearings, and uh, not be so scared that their life was going to you know crumble and, and end at this point. So, um, and the producer assure, assured me that the piece wasn't a ne- negative piece. So that was, <laughs> that good. was a good, yeah, that was yeah. a good. Uh, well, it was, it was excellent. I, I mean, that, that was really fantastic at getting the word out, really. You know, which kind of leads right into the next question I wrote down for you. We just talked about the perception of uh, what we're talking about, of short selling or, in your space, the strategic defaulting. We talked about the perception, how much that's changed. You know, in 2007, John, no one knew what a short sale was, and I can guarantee you no one knew what the heck a strategic default was. But now everybody knows what it is. What are the other things that have really changed in just the past, you know, seven years now since the, well, maybe five to seven years since the real estate market has really gone through a serious correction? Well, I think um, a lot of it is psychological where, you know, in 2007, 2008, when someone, um, they were extremely embarrassed or very, they felt shame and, and, you know, they were in tears when they would call us on the phone there. You know, rightfully so, they felt like they were losing the American dream. They felt like, you know, this is the last thing they would ever, uh, you know, imagine could happen to them and their family. And they're going through this and, and tears are flowing, very emotional, a lot of emotions involved. And um, that was, you know, predominantly the 2008, you know, the year, the whole year was like that for us. And then, you know, once 2009 came, um, there was actually a pretty strong drop off of of calls and uh, and things to our to our website to our company because I believe a lot you know with the new administration when Obama came in uh, there was a lot of promises and hope that you know there really was going to be big change and that uh, you know we even heard phone calls like well you know Obama's going to pay my mortgage and all these things and and uh, so we just kind of wow okay we took you know a step back and we waited and waited and then you know pretty much towards the end of '09. Uh, things really started turning around, and people, you know, couldn't couldn't really continue to hold on 
uh, you know, obviously there's more, all those uh, government programs came out trying to modify people, and we know how those failed, and, you know, they aimed to modify millions of people, and they only ended up modifying, you know, a small portion of that. And then, um, really, in 2010, we saw a very strong shift from people who had the emotion, the tears, um, the devastation, to more of a very black and white strategic, you know, gr- um, you know, very aware, understanding, educated, um, you know, business and financial decision. They were starting to look at it that way, which really started turning into the strategic default. Um, you know, when people had heard, you know, their coworker, or their neighbor, or their brother, or their uncle, you know, had done this, and they're not in jail, or they're not, um, you know, they still have, you know, a job, or they still have, they were able to get into a rental property. So people really started saying, you know, this is not as bad as, as either, you know, people want us to think, or just it's not as bad as I thought it was, and. You know, maybe this is the best step for me to push reset and and uh, you know start over and just you know make better decisions in the future and and uh, move move on with this. You know. Well, you you said something interesting, and it is so true. Um, back when you know people would have historically, if their families were to fall into hard times, the last thing that they wouldn't pay is their mortgage. Now right. it's the first thing they stop paying. Right. Mm-hmm, I mean, mm-hmm. they and, and that was a total consumer shift, and the people were paying their credit cards on time. You know that the credit card charge offs and, and whatnot they spiked, but then they came back down to normal levels at the same time. And mortgage defaults were increasing, and you know credit reporting for sec, you know second and third month missed payments that were increasing. So it is a pretty monumental shift in in Americans' mindset to uh, really what a, a mortgage is and what it isn't. So you know, let's get into this with regards to some specific things, you know, about strategic default, what are the ramifications of it? We at Harris Real State University deal with a lot of the types of questions that I'm sure you do too, as effects on the credit and the and then there's of course the uh you know, do you have what is the definition of a hardship? Now you guys do you advise people to go one of two ways. Well you explain your service, but really when someone calls you up, how do you Tell me how it works. How do you counsel me and what I should do or, you know, walk me through the process? Well, we try to keep a fine line on legal information and we don't we don't give any legal advice or even advice in, in general. Um, what we do is we let them know what, you know, what their state laws are, um, how we can help them, how we can guide them through this process to make it easier for them, um, educate them. And and be able to be there sort of as a, a you know a coach as if they if they have a question in the middle of the night they can email us if they have you know a question about anything as they're going through it we're just a phone call away or a, a you know e- instant chat message away and we review documents that are sent to them in their mail you know as as people get default notices then now they're public record and and one one of the ways that real estate agents can uh, farm in market areas as they look at, you know, default notices. And so, unfortunately, there are good, you know, there are good uh, ways that people reach out to these homeowners, and there are, there are bad ways, and we've seen them all. We've seen uh, many, many times these homeowners get letters that look like, you know, very scary official um, documents from the court, and, you know, at the very bottom in, like, the tiniest fine print it says, this is an advertisement, you know, and but it looks to the homeowner as that, you know, this is very scary and, you know, you better call now, you know, this attorney. And, um, you know, sometimes it's attorneys that are, you know, sending these letters out or loan mod companies. And um, and so, you know, they, they get hounded with all this information that just is simply overwhelming. And to bring some clarity to the chaos, you know, we allow them to fax it to us. And if it's a legal notice, it's a real legal notice, we can forward that to an attorney that's in our network and, that attorney will respond to them, letting them know what they should do. And um, so we really handle it all. But what we do in the beginning is um, we kind of let, lay it all out for them, what the law is, what the potential ramifications are, the, the tax you know, consequences, and, you know, according to their state. And then we um, let them know there are our, our options, like loan modification, short sales, or, um, st- or just foreclosure. And we we educate them that, Really, we're not steering them one way or another. We're saying, you know, whatever's in your best interest, you're going to know that, and they do get an attorney consultation. So 
they get to get that legal advice from the attorney. Um, and when they're deciding on what they want to do, they, a lot of them will attempt to short sell. However, um, oftentimes, and it's, I know it's changing, but earlier on when people would attempt to short sale, we all know they had to be in default. Um, usually it was 90 days um, before a bank would even talk to them about you know, um, taking a short payoff. And, and, so, and they also would have to qualify for that short sale, so they would have to show their income. And you know, when the people who were coming to us were a little more you know, well-off, they had a job and they had some money in the bank, and they were in a situation where they didn't want to divulge that information to the bank, then they would maybe elect to not do a short sale because they knew that at that point that, you know, they would have to show all their financials and the odds were that the bank could possibly ask them to contribute towards that that uh, deficiency amount. Um, so some of them would, you know, you know, they learned the hard way and they would get denied from, getting a short sale and they'd end up in a foreclosure anyways. And then some other ones would end up getting, um, you know, workout letters from their lender and, um, and, and be able to stay in the house. But really our main goal was to take away this nebulous kind of scary, freaky, um, you know, thought that, you know, their life was over, their financial future was doomed and, and uh, really tried to help them understand that, you know, they can recover from this and they can minimize the uh, the impact on your credit by isolating the foreclosure. Don't pay off or don't stop paying everything. Just you know you can if you only if you only stop paying the mortgage, then that's one trade line out of you know 20 or 10, however many you have you know, on your credit, and that will be affected accordingly. And what we found uh, is that really it only affected their credit maybe 100 points in many cases, and you know, the credit score would start to recover and, and heal after, you know, after a year or so and, and started climbing back up and people would report back to us, oh my gosh, my credit is, you know, back in the 680s or 700s and it's only been a year or a year and a half and um, we started getting these reports and it was really encouraging that, um, you know, these people really um, isolated and, and uh, took a real strategic um, effort to, to keep their credit intact and do the best thing that they could for their family financially. Well, I mean, just everything you're saying, and, you know, it's interesting. The banks now, as you know, are encouraging owners to do short sales. They uh, Chase has a program now. Well, rumor is they have a program where it's going to increase from up to 30000 up to 50000 I've heard that Bank of America is, you know, they're definitely at 30000 that an owner can get for short selling, and they're going to increase that to 50000 Cities doing something similar. Um the banks now are encouraging agents to literally submit a short sale for pre-approval, and then at that point, it's basically a you know very quick, relatively quick process compared to traditional short sales. Mm-hmm. So the banks really have come around. But what's really interesting is what you just said is how the credit actually is treating someone who does a short sale. Um, you can buy again using conventional FHA type guidelines after 24 months. 24 months after a short sale, you can buy a house. Uh, Absolutely, so, uh, especially if you put money down. Right. You know, there's a lot of things that it just, it's incredible just in this such a relatively short period of time, how many different reportings and systems and whatnot have been reformed to really, I think, take into consideration the fact that a lot of people did get stuck with these underwater mortgages. But John, what I think is scary, and you and I were talking about that, uh, talking about this prior to our call today, is that there's as few as 11 million, and as according to Zillow, as many as 19 million homeowners that are still underwater in their mortgages today. And here yeah. it is. You know, people aren't talking about that. It's not on the headline. It's not leading, you know, New York Times. 60 Minutes isn't reporting on this. I haven't heard anything uh, about anybody really shedding light on the fact that this problem it hasn't gone away at all. And if anything, it seems to uh, be getting a little bit worse in certain parts of the country. You know, John, how long do you think we're going to be in this type of market where it's going to be so, you know, bifurcated, where there's going to be the haves and the have-nots? Well, it, it's interesting because when I first launched youwalkaway.com there was there was a moment when i kind of was asked by several really smart people they you know attorneys and real estate people that had been in the business for their entire life and they were older and they said you know how long do you think this business is going to last john i mean you know this is a smart thing to do to get into this business and i said well I, you know i think it'll last a couple years maybe three years and um they looked at me and you know i remember one instance where they said, no, I think it's going to last a year and things are going to you know, turn back around. And 
I kind of just said I, you know, respectfully disagree because, you know, X, Y, and Z, and I kind of laid it out. But, um, you know, here we are five years later, and it's still, you know, we're we're in a situation, like you said, with, you know, millions and millions of people, tens of millions of people that are underwater and they're on their mortgages. And um, it's, it's, a, it's really, you know, whenever anyone argues with me about it, I, I always bring up the fact that, you know, are we – you know, can we all agree that there was a real estate bubble? And they say, yes. Well, you know, how did that bubble come to be? And, um, you know, they quickly say, well, you know, the lending guidelines were really loose and appraisers were appraising houses for, you know, more than they were worth and everyone was, you know, all the mortgage guys were, you know, doing stated income and blah, blah, blah. And I say, okay, well, you know, that that is why these values were so high. It wasn't for any other reason. So we all can agree that there was a bubble. We can also agree that that bubble meant that these values were inflated and they, they weren't real values. So, you know, as things came down, um, it really is unfortunate for the American dream and the people who really, you know, they were so excited that they got a house and they were so excited that, you know, they got into this. And, you know, of course there were some that were, you know, obviously manipulating the system and, you know, people who shouldn't have gotten four or five homes, uh, you know, investment properties were doing that. But I would say out of you know ninety percent or, or so of people out there really just were trying to get you know into the into a into the American dream and own a home and and they didn't have to put any money down and and now they're stuck and they're plagued with that that shame or that decision you know and what's really sad about it too is that they they have a negative net worth because of this and this was you know preached by our economic leaders chief economists, government officials, that this, that, that, a, uh, that a home was the best investment that you could make. You know? So what are these people to do? They're in this situation now. And as long as the banks keep the inventory flow very, very tight and trickled, um, we probably will stay very stable um, with the housing market. You know, maybe it's a false floor or, or whatever, but, um, and I don't, I don't predict that the floor will fall out um, because I do believe that the banks, unless some drastic change happens with legislation or rules of accounting, that they can, can they can continue to for the for long you know for long as they want to keep properties at bay and keep the inventory where they want it to where they can kind of control this for and it and it may take another decade to, well, somebody to asked, really. So, somebody asked me that question the other day, right? It's the same question I asked you, but yeah. they they ended it with, "Well, so how long do you think this will go on? What would you know cause it to change? You know, looking for some sort of you know, lots of people are beginning to believe there's going to be another big crash in housing. That I'm sure you've read the articles. A lot of people are, um, you know, basing it on the number of underwater owners, the amount of shadow inventory that supposedly the banks are controlling. We're going to talk about shadow inventory in a second. Mm-hmm. And they're all they're all saying, well, at some point this you know this bubble, this balloon's going to pop, and all this stuff's going to flood on the market. And then when he, the guy asked me that question, thinking I was going to fall in alignment with his question, <laughs> and I said, well, what would cause that? To, exactly what you said, John. What exactly would cause that to happen? You know, what's going to cause all that what you just laid out to happen? Nothing. Right. So the reality of it is, it is going to be just like you said, and it's going to be not you know 12 months or 36 months. It's going to be. Decades, maybe in some parts of the market, the, in the country, the markets will never recover. It's, you know, Julie and I sold real estate in Ohio, and there are parts of Ohio that never recovered from crashes that happened back in the 60s and 70s and the 80s. Real estate doesn't always go up. That's, I know you're in San Diego, and that's kind of a new thought for people in those parts, you know, nice parts of the world. But, you know, for the most part, people's mindsets about housing seems to have shifted. Actually, that is kind of an interesting question. This goes to an, a, an article that you wrote, which I thought was really fascinating about baby boomers and their mindsets about strategic default. Mm-hmm. A lot of great statistics on there. I really appreciated you publishing that because I, I think people reading it are going to realize that you know I am in that situation. I don't need to stay in this situation. How have um, from that article when you read the results of the article? And I'll share with some statistics if you know uh, if you think it will help, but. When you were looking at the results of that survey, did it surprise you? Yeah, I mean, it really did. I I, I didn't think, and and we really didn't have a lot of you know baby boomers and and you know 55, 60 plus age group in the beginning, other than the ones that lost their jobs, you know, and that. So it wasn't something that kind of stood out. But then 
sometime in 2010, 2011, I started hearing from our sales advocates that, uh, you, know, you know, John, I'm, I'm getting a lot of calls from, you know, people who were referred to us by their financial planner. And their financial planner said, you know, you, you're not going to reach your retirement goals if you continue with this house. And so, you know, you should reach out to this You Walk Away company. And, um, and so I started, like, looking into that and, and really paying more attention to it. And it made sense. You know, I really started seeing, you know, op- the opposite where, you know, you know, college kids used to go, go move in with their parents after college or, you know, come back home for a, a bit while they're trying to find a job. But it was it was almost the opposite. I started seeing more of a trend where you know par- people that were elderly were starting to move back in with their 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 their, their, their um, sorry their kids. Kids, yeah, yeah. Well, let me John, let me sh- let, let me share some of these statistics. I wrote down sure. the ones that I think kind of jumped out at me the most. Um, so, 48 percent um, depleted a good portion of their savings prior to making a decision to walk away. And these are our baby boomer folks. 68% cited property values as a key reason for walking away. Only 5% cited health reasons, which, as we talked about earlier, would be the traditional reason for going into default. Mm-hmm. 53% said they would have walked away. This is really interesting, I thought. 53% said they would have walked away if they were 20 years younger, while 23% say they not, would not have. The remaining 24% said the question was not applicable. You know, uh, they were not uh, old enough to have a house when, you know, say 20 years ago. 30% said retirement was a factor in their decision, right, what you just said. Mm-hmm. 22% made the mistake of tapping retirement accounts, made the mistake of tapping retirement accounts before walking away, and another 16% consider doing so, but society against it, and 63% never considered it. And I can go on. There's a lot of other great statistics. But it is a clear sign that folks' mindset, and even in uh, an older generation, that their mindsets about mortgages and, and you know contractual obligations and all the rest of it, it has shifted, and people are now, as you said, thinking more like business people, black and white type decisions. And that does really, truly have a serious impact on housing going forward. Um, so, as far as this market that we're sifting through, I think every, I think you're in agreement, and I'm in agreement. Depending on where you are in the in the country, you could always, as a realtor, that's our primary listeners, you could always be in a market where you're dealing with a certain percent, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of the owners. And in Las Vegas, where Julie and I live, 55 percent of everyone with a mortgage is underwater. I mean, that's mm-hmm. incredible. That's not going to clear out anytime soon. Which leads to this strange market, which we're going to talk about shadow inventory here. It leads to this strange market where there's this, been this rise, Case Shiller numbers, this rise in home values, this rise in um, you know buyer interest, this this really this strange w- world we're living in, where it almost feels like it's a hot seller's market again, <laughs> and yet we know statistically that there's all these homes that are in default, going in default, all these underwater owners, all these you know it just doesn't make sense. What the heck's going on, John? <laughs> well, I, I think that um, you know you, you, I like to call it the shady inventory because it's <laughs> there's something shady going on, and and you know it's it, whether it's legal or not, it's got to be legal, otherwise there'd be you know. There'd be a lot more uh, issues with it, but um, when the count, uh, the counting rules changed, mark to market rules changed, it really gave the banks that control of well, we can hold on to this stuff and we don't have to unload it because you know we can keep it on books as you know as a as a positive in our you know in our in our assets and and so. Well, well let, 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 I, I want to drill down on that for a second because that's something um, that is important that folks understand. Mark to market rules, meaning the banks don't have to declare not a non performing asset as non performing until what happens? Until it sells. That's right. So guys, that's the difference. So right now, when and John and I are going to talk about this very controversial subject of shadow inventory, which I know a lot of people have different differing opinions on. But the fact is the banks don't have to actually take it as a loss until it sells. So it is any wonder why in some markets the banks are not in a particular hurry to put stuff for sale. So you said it was the shady inventory. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, you know, it's like, um, I don't know, there's a there's number of uh, of laws. Uh, Sherman, I can't remember exactly how it's, whether it was the Sherman Act or the Sherman something act. Sherman um, Antitrust Act was part yes, of it, I believe. Yes, the Sherman yep. Antitrust Act, exactly. Well, um, you know, there was a, there was a big... Um, 
lawsuits and uh, you know back in the with diamonds you know because they could keep the inventory on diamonds back and that would keep the the value of the diamonds up. So they you know they always had to pay you know restitution and paid a lot of fees and millions and and, and stuff for their crime that they committed doing that. But um, you know <laughs> in any kind of market there is the supply and demand and. Really, if someone can control the supply, then they can control the value of that uh, of that assets. And in this case, you know, real estate, um, you know, there's there is the, the, I guess the reason why it's not a a big issue is that everyone wants values to be higher. I, w- I shouldn't say everyone. Majority of people who own homes, or I would say almost all home- homeowners, want their homes to be worth more. So there's no real there's nobody out there, you know, complaining about it. They want they want these values to come back. They want, but you know, the people who don't own homes or rented or who, you know, played by the rules, not played by the rules, but who kind of sat on the sidelines and waited um, while this boom was happening. Those people really can't get a true price on a house. That's uh, that what it's you know what it would be worth if if the inventory was all out. Um, so it's it's you know there's a there is a controversy there and. Um, I'm not against it in the sense that, you know, I, you know, I have a house as well and I, I don't want the values to drop, you know, it, it's awful when values drop, but um, at the same time, you know, it, it is going to kick the can down the road and make this problem last a lot longer. Well, it's, John, it's choosing winner, right, the policy right now, and it's interesting you bring up the whole De Beers diamond thing, and guys, it's a little, it's an interesting little story, but in essence, diamonds aren't rare. It's a, con- it's a controlled product. Uh, De Beer, uh, uh, GE actually, John, tried to get in. They they figured out how to make diamonds. So GE actually knew how to make diamonds, and the, and the and the whole lawsuit came about because De Beers was like up in arms. Holy crap! This company's figured out how to make diamonds, and obviously we're not going to be able to control the market anymore. So GE and De Beers got together, and uh, GE agreed. Who knows how the whole agreement worked out to not make anything other than industrial diamonds which are mm-hmm. things that go on drill tips and things of that nature, whereas De Beers would have the jewelry market. So that's where the whole legal shamil came from. But I thought that was an interesting analogy because it truly is. It's, an, it's a controlled marketplace right now. But the policies, QE3, Operation Twist, the different da 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 it really is picking winners and losers right now. And it goes back to the fact that we're entering into this phase, certainly in the real estate industry, Maybe even our country, where and, and this isn't meant to be a political statement; it's just an observation, where we truly are picking winners and losers. But there's haves and there have nots, and you know that is not good for the health of the housing market, let alone the country. It's kind of what I hear right. you saying. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So let's talk about it. Shadow inventory. What the heck? Do you believe in it? Is there a shadow inventory? You said shady inventory, which I think is kind of funny. But what about shadow inventory? Let's talk about that. Is there a shadow inventory? Are the banks, you mentioned a few times, that you perceive that they're holding things off the market? Anything else you want to share on that? Yeah, I mean, they you know, they, they use the term strategic default for homeowners. I, I kind of use the term strategic release, you know, for them. And it's <laughs> it's really, it is a strategy, you know, on both sides. And, um, it, you know, each one has their incentives of why they're doing it. And, uh, the, the shadow inventory. There's there's no question that there's a shadow inventory, um, and really, but is that shadow inventory real in the sense that you know is it going to really affect you know our housing market? And and I don't think it'll be something that is seen as a huge you know um, massive drop in in our in our housing market or another huge housing crisis necessarily. But I think it is just something that's going to kind of weigh or hold back, tether the uh, the increase of values, um, because you know if over time, if if it would have let's say the housing market would have crashed again and it came down to realistic levels with the amount of true inventory that's that's there, you know if you go down a street and you see boarded up homes or you see homes that are vacant, you know if those if all those homes were available on the market. Then the true value of housing would be, you know, it'd be way low, and then you'd see a slow rise again back up um, over time. So what we're probably going to have is we probably won't have that big dip crash again, but we'll just have this kind of very steady, you know, uh, lifeless real estate market over Zombie the next market. ten years. 
Yeah, it's basically a zombie market. In most yeah, most parts of the country, it's yeah, it's a zombie market. Really, it's kind of just like as a listing agent. I mean, it, it is hard to be a listing agent nowadays because you get a listing lead. Okay, is this person, you know, are they an expired <laughs> for sale by owner? Are they an equity seller? Are they underwater? Are they underwater with one you know price change? Is this a relocation? Is this a lead from a bank? Is this? I mean, it's just everything in our industry has completely changed. Five, six years ago, it was okay. Everyone's got equity. Let's go and get the house sold. Yeah, so it was the level, Yeah, it was. It was so well. You were in the mortgage business. You know better than anybody. I mean, the, the industry. The industry has gotten so much more challenging. The skills that agents have to know. The the level of, you know, I don't. I hate using the word expertise because I think you cross the line and start getting into some legal terminology. But the the level of of, of really professionalism and um, the knowledge base you have to have in our in our industry, and it, it is inc- it's extreme. It really is. And, and if you're in certain, you know, it's interesting though, John. On the upper end stuff, we have folks that are selling, you know, east side of Manhattan, and we have people that are selling in you know Beverly Hills and and those really really upper end areas. When they run mm-hmm. into somebody who can't sell or has doesn't have the equity that they thought they would, they just lease it. You know, that's the other right. big trend. That, you know, that's the other huge trend that really we're going to see effect is more people are going to migrate towards long-term rentership versus having it be a rite of passage into, you know, being an adult, being a homeowner. Do, do you think there is a kind of a shifting of the sands about the mindset about homeownership? Yeah, I, I do. And I thought, I, you know, we've done a recent survey, which I'll touch on in a minute, but the um, the thought was that, you know, we're becoming a renter nation and, uh, yeah, you, know, you can see everything these days for rent. You know, your college books. Um, you know, even now dresses for for ladies who are going to go to the prom or for the you know for their bridesmaids or for you know fancy dinners. You can actually rent a dress nowadays. You can rent cars by the hour. You can from rent a dog. Here it appears. You know, we did you a can whole rent a dog. Women you know, rent, you can rent a dog if you want to. Yeah. You know, if you're a guy that wants to you know get you know make friends, whatever. You know, you, you can rent whatever now that, nowadays. So. There is a, there certainly is the, um, the stigma of renting or the, uh, the negative uh, side to renting is sort of uh, dropped a little bit. And but interesting, an interesting thing that we did a survey on was, you know, out of all these homeowners that we have, the, the thousands of clients that we've had over the years, uh, we surveyed them and asked how many of them would like to own again. And I was uh, quite shocked that. Uh, over 80% of them want to buy again, you know, in the next five years. Why did that shock you? Um, I mean, it, it shocked me that it was that high because, um, you know, I knew that a lot of them wanted to buy again, and I think you know a lot of them felt like they bought the wrong time, obviously. But um, I just, you know, because I was getting reports that people were happy with renting, and. So I thought, okay, maybe the, you know they're going to be happy with renting and the the freedom that comes with renting, not having to fix the roof or the, you know, the toilet broke or the plumbing, whatever. And and so they're able to, um, you know, really just have that freedom again. But I do think that there is that pride of home ownership, and um, you know, you you can you literally can no one can tell you you know if you want to paint your your walls pink or polka dot. You know, you, it's, there's something about that you know ownership of a house that. Uh, really, really is a part of our culture and part of our, you know, just our our psychology. It triggers something in our lizard brains, wanting to have your own cave, you know, wanting to have something that's yours that you can call your own. And, you know, to NAR's credit, I love the fact that they are not running a single commercial anymore, anywhere, about homeownership being anything other than just basically, you know, what it truly was. And it truly is supposed to be as essentially as a place to raise your family, to create memories, a place where you can feel secure, you know, your home. Um, whereas before, a lot of the commercials coming out from everywhere in our industry, you know, industry including mortgages and whatnot, it's all about the financial, da 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 da, da. So they're tapping into the greed, you know, mm-hmm. the greed button in people. Now the whole industry has sort of migrated towards, I think, really the essence of why you want to own a home. So to your point, I uh, that will never go away. I don't think so either. And it's a function of the age, right? So at a certain point when people start getting the family formation stage of life, then they say, well, you know, I need a safe place to raise my kids and all that. So, But we're, if you look at the next generation, the Generation Y, right, they're, the oldest one is 33, and the majority of them are just barely out of college. So it's going to be a while before there's going to be a big rush to home ownership again. So this transitional phase is going to be interesting. In the meantime, you know, 11 to 19 million people are going to have to decide what the heck they're going to do with their mortgages. 
Um, and I assume right. that a lot, of, a lot of those people are going to end up calling one of our agents, or they're going to end up calling you. So right. you know, that's that's basically at this point in, in the game in the correction. That's one of those two solutions. Are certainly the better solutions. Is who isn't a good client for you? So if someone calls up and said, John, I want to strategically default, or I want to da da da, who do you turn away? Who do you say this isn't a good fit for you? Does that ever happen? Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, for for certainly we would we would turn people away. We would say, well, have you tried a loan modification? And if they said no, we would say, well, you know, try one and then call us. Um, uh, call us back if the lender says no, or if you can't get any answer, or, or just you know, you're fearing foreclosure. Um, because we're not going to stop the foreclosure sale. We're not going to postpone it. We're not going to delay it. Um, as as your guide, you know, you walk away. So we would turn away people back then quite often um, for that reason. But I would say that the person that's um, that wouldn't be our client is someone who really, really has sentimental value in their house that, you know, they there's their parents' home and they, you know, they birthed their kids there. They've grown up there. They've got all this they don't want to walk away from their house, really. You know, they, they, uh, they might need something out of the box, something that's, you know, I've, you hear kind of on the fringe that's just, you know, you hear it happening on a small scale, but uh, like, you know, where you can really challenge the lender, sue them, do whatever. You know, there's all kinds of other tricks people do that I don't necessarily advocate or, or recommend. But in that case, if, you, if, you're, if you're really just tied and attached to that house, then I would recommend just fighting for it, you know, doing everything you can to keep it. Um, and we often ask people that: Is this something you have? You know, is this home something you have sentimental value in? Is it, or is it just a house? It's not. It's not really a home, you know. Is it? Is it something that, you know, you've got? Um, for for what reason did you want to buy the house? Did you buy it for because eventually you were going to want to move up into a bigger house, or you know, is a starter home, or whatever it might be? And uh, a lot more often than not, people are you know, not very attached to their homes. Um, they have a lot of, um, you know, I wouldn't say bad memories, but because of the economic uh, crash and all the problems that have faced, we've, you know, the, the economy has faced over the last four years, five years, um, you know, people have had some, some bad situations and they just sort of want to get out. You know, they want to get out of the house, they want to start new, and there's a psychological aspect to that of just, you know, let's leave that behind and, and start fresh, start new, you know. That's probably the most rewarding aspect of teaching agents how to uh, do short sales, help distressed owners, mm-hmm. is that exact experience. The same feeling, you know, you guys have, I'm sure, on a daily basis with your clients as well, is that they don't realize how big of a burden they're carrying around until it's not there anymore. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's – that's so, uh, realtors across the country, um, any any suggestions, any – advice to them any way that they can work with you is is, is any way you want to connect our listeners to maybe your business in any way we can help each other yeah absolutely i mean we we have uh, gone to great lengths to create a network of real estate agents because um you know we are pro you know pro real estate pro real estate agents um uh, what we want obviously is to have an agent really give the bet you know really put the client first and that's Partly why we've been successful and have had happy clients is because they know that we're not looking to get a commission out of of you know of that person. We just have a flat fee and that's good for the whole the whole thing, whatever the outcome is. And we're, we're there for them for in many cases two three years for that small flat fee. So um, I think the way that uh, I think we could work with agents is um, is you know reach out to us. Um, we we certainly will add. Uh, we have a good network right now, but there are obviously pockets of areas that we get clients in that we don't have agents in our network. So, um, you know, we certainly would like people who are um, not opposed to, you know, if someone has to strategically fall and if it's in their best interest um, and they're not going to be able to get a sale, um, that they would also – have that client in you know, its best interest, and they would re- recommend them back to us. Or so. So uh, what I what I think I hear you saying is you guys will often come across uh, owners who want to explore the short sale, and you guys give them the broad strokes, and in some cases you refer them to an agent um, for that listing service of the short sale. But you're yeah, almost for, every time we we do yeah. refer them to somebody just so they can you know they can explore that option, especially if they've shown interest in in exploring that option. 
and you guys are, you know, the your sort of <clears throat> deciding factor as to who you're going to refer those uh, potential listing leads to on an agent from an agent's perspective is they have to always be doing what's best for that owner. So if that owner, if it strategically and financially makes better sense for them to do a you know traditional strategic default without a short sale, you want that realtor to always you know put the interest of that seller first and not their commission. That's what I'm hearing you say, correct? Yes, exactly. So how does someone become part of your network? You you mentioned that you're not looking for that many uh, agents, but how does that work? What's how does that process work? Because you have to be generating a lot of potential listing leads. Yeah, we do, and and I would just say email us at info at youwalkaway dot com, and believe it or not, that comes to me, and I will um, <laughs> forward that to our um, to our the, our head uh, list uh, our head um, broker who does all of the uh, kind of coordination for that. So. Do you guys have referral fees with those leads, assuming they uh, close? Do you, is that yeah, how it the, works? The broker that, um, that does it, um, he usually likes to do, or him and his team, I should say, likes to do some of the negotiations on the short sale. And oh. he's done, like, you know, I don't know how many, hundreds or thousands of these negotiations he's done, but they, their team has done a significant amount. And so they have very good relationships with all these big banks like Bank of America, City, you know, all the all the big ones, and and even some, some of the smaller credit unions and things. But um, you know, with that kind of volume, what tends to happen is, you know, the uh, will refer out the lead, or I should say, the uh, the broker will refer out the lead to the agent, and the agent will list it, but leave the negotiations up to uh, the short sale team um, negotiators, and then they will. Uh, sharing the commission, you know, broker to broker referral. Sounds like a great deal. So, agents, you're out there listening. Um, if uh, you want to find out from John, and John, you've been warned that you're probably going to get a couple of emails. <laughs> uh, if, you might want to redirect that email now. <laughs> but it's info. <laughs> it's info at youwalkaway.com, and uh, John will screen the emails and direct them towards uh, the appropriate uh, person. And uh, if he's looking for agents in your particular market, that might be a great lead source for all of you. Just make sure your heads are, you know, in, in alignment with basically with what you walk away's mission is. And I and I think many Harrisville State University students, you know, they walk the walk. They understand that at the end of the day, it really is about doing what's best for the homeowner. And John, I really, really think it's amazing that you had the insight uh, back in the day to start this. It's a great idea. Um, I love that you had the courage to put this idea forward in the marketplace. And um, I think in a lot of ways you helped the real estate industry uh, through this curing process. You kind of showed people a way through this that maybe without you starting your company and um, maybe in some tiny microscopic way without us showing people how to do short sales, things would be a lot worse off. You know, the pressures wouldn't be there on the banks and the government and the politicians to really do what's best for homeowners. You know, whether or not their programs are working or not really doesn't matter. The fact is that owners now are well aware of their alternatives opposed to just staying in these mortgages forever and, you know, as you touched on a second ago, essentially being financially bankrupt for the rest of their lives. Now they at least know they have alternatives. So for that, I sincerely thank you. Well, thank you for what you said, and, um, you know, I appreciate what you guys are doing there and and the uh, education you're giving to these real estate agents, I'm sure, is very valuable. And, um, you know, it, 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 we, you're right, people need uh, – need to know what's going on out there and they need to get better educated about everything so they can make well-informed decisions and you know and do what's best for their family i think that's the most important thing is is really that uh these homeowners do what's best for you know their their future their financial future their kids you know and and the health of their you know their family and ultimately the health of their communities the health health, health of their cities their states i mean the faster we're through this the better it is going to be for everybody going forward so Thanks for being part of that. And John, CEO of YouWalkAway.com, I sincerely thank you for being today's Harris Real Estate University superstar. And everyone else, thanks for listening. If you want to listen to past superstar interviews with oh, such people as the president of Keller Williams, the president of uh, Realtor.com, I'm sorry, the president of uh, National Association of Realtors, if you want to listen to all these past interviews, they are on, of course, RealEstateInsiderNews.com for your free download and listening enjoyment anytime you'd like. So, John and everyone else, thanks for joining us today's Harris Real Estate University Superstar Interview End.